from the opinion pages of the Wall Street Journal. This is Free Expression with Jerry Baker. Hello and welcome to Free Expression, a weekly podcast from the Wall Street Journal editorial page with me, Jerry Baker, editor-at-large of the journal. Thanks for listening. If you're not already a subscriber, please do sign up at Apple, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcasts. This week, as the primary contest for the Republican presidential nomination is about to get underway with the first debate scheduled for later this month, I'm taking another dive into the roiling debate over the future of conservatism with one of our most prominent and some would say controversial modern conservative thinkers. Patrick Deneen is Professor of Political Science at the University of Notre Dame. His 2018 book, Why Liberalism Fails, set out a strong case against what political protagonists and thinkers of both left and right had long considered axiomatic. He argued that the liberal democracy most of us assumed had triumphed over all other competing ideologies in history in the closing years of the 20th century had in fact failed us. It was liberalism itself, he said, that was responsible for the dysfunctional and demoralized Western societies of the last 10 years or so, that in turn have birthed the politics of Donald Trump, Brexit, and so-called populist movements across the Western democracies. In his latest book, which has just been published, called Regime Change, he advances the argument by making the case for what he says should now replace liberalism, what he and others have generally called common good conservatism, a governing philosophy that, among other things, elevates traditional values, culture, and institutions to restore the primacy of national solidarity and cohesion over ideas of progressivism, progress in general, and individual liberty. And Patrick Deneen joins me now. Professor Deneen, thanks very much for joining Free Expression. It's my pleasure. It's nice to be here. The prescriptions that you lay out in your new book. But let's start, if we may, by defining our terms and, and sort of recapping and reprising the arguments you made in the first book, which you do, of course, at the start of this latest book, too, which is about liberalism, the idea of kind of liberal democracy, which, as I said, is sort of many of us for years had thought was sort of axiomatic that we'd been on this progress throughout history and, you know, we'd reached the end of history with the triumph of liberal democracy at the end of the 20th century. You take strong issue with that. And you argue that liberalism has failed. So, can we start by, first of all, sort of just defining our terms, what you mean by liberalism, because I know, and again, you in this book and others, you go into the different strands of what we might call liberalism. But let's talk about liberalism and recap for us why and how you think liberalism has failed. Well, I feel like I've defined these terms many times, and yet I have to acknowledge up front there are many, many definitions of liberalism. And so mine is a particular definition, and maybe everyone won't disagree with it. But I do think two qualities of this when you speak of the axiomatic nature that everyone agreed with, which is that liberalism is really about societies that are organized around the principle that the maximization of individual liberty is really the purpose and end and the sort of the limiting end of what a political order is established. And so I think in some ways you could say this definition of human liberty has its partisans across what we think of as the partisan divide. In other words, you have left versions of this idea of liberty, which you see especially manifested in the kind of social domain. We think of this as partly quite extensively one of the fruits of and one of the drivers of the sexual revolution that really one should be able to define one's own sexual nature and, of course, today one's gender in whatever way one wishes and one desires. We also, of course, see this as a fundamental tenet of many on the right. I think rural tradition, and it's certainly well represented in the pages of the Wall Street Journal, but this is especially kind of the object and aim of politics is to secure the greatest degree of individual liberty to make one's free choices. And that's especially in the marketplace, but not only in the marketplace, but that's especially where those free choices take place. And the argument of my book formed around this prioritization of individual liberty, individual fashioning is ultimately going to undo the kind of necessary solidarity. But more than that is actually going to become dysfunctional. But also a kind of rampant individualism actually feeds the very thing that I think is feared, particularly on the political right, which is the rise of a nanny state and the bureaucratic state that's been the long, the great fear of the kind of classical liberal tradition. These are arguments you can find expressed, of course, in the pages of Alexis de Tocque America, who said that the greatest source of kind of centralization is precisely the advance of individualism. And this leads to the decline, the weakening of the kind of institutions of civil society, of course, the family, churches, neighborhoods, communities. And without these institutions that allow for the flourishing of human lives, people are kind of left of sources of assistance and will turn increasingly to the central state. So the irony is that in the case of the political right, it's pursued a program of advancing individual liberty, which ironically and paradoxically perhaps has actually fed 
the growth of the centralized state that it warned us was the great thing to be feared. We're seeing both on the left and the right these dynamics that are contributing to this current condition. And I'm particularly writing this book to those on the right who are willing to acknowledge that the course of conservatism over the last half century or so perhaps was not the right course. Again, before we get into the prescriptions that you lay out in the new book, let's just dig into this a little bit. And again, you say again in your books, and you said it again there, that this concept of liberalism is very much a bipartisan concept with a particularly strong conservative construct. And I think you talk again about classical liberalism, that that itself, a sort of conservative approach there, but also particularly in the last 30 or 40 years, you know, what's sometimes called neoliberalism, what you just described again as kind of Wall Street Journal editorial page, the kind of ideas associated with Margaret Thatcher and Ronald Reagan. You know, you say that's fair. But it was only 20 years ago when it was deemed pretty well axiomatic, except on perhaps the extreme left, that actually the reforms that Reagan and Thatcher introduced, that those ideas of, again, sort of neoliberalism, of freeing up markets, of freeing business, of global economic integration, actually caused not only tremendous unleashing of economic potential, which we clearly saw with a significant acceleration of growth, in the 80s and 90s in the United States and elsewhere. These were so obviously ascendant, if you like, and triumphant that versions of them became the model for any countries around the world. Many countries moved in the direction of that economic liberalism, in particular, even a country like communist China. So, of course, everybody would accept that we've had some pathologies on display in the last 10 or 20 years. But to kind of throw that baby of economic liberalism, of the idea of freedom, of promoting markets out with the sort of the general bathwater of the liberalism that you know a lot of us have come to see as perhaps extreme, seems maybe rather short-sighted. I would actually suggest that to claim that the ascendancy of this, or let's say the success or the seeming success of the economic, you know, the dynamism of the Reagan and Thatcher era were short-sighted victories, or the, to view them as victories uh, was in many ways short-sighted, that it turned really Pyrrhic victories, and not just, of course, victories that were proved not to be to the benefit of people on the left who despaired of the welfare state, but have actually proven to be Pyrrhic and ultimately self on the right, who believed that this was how one would secure a well-ordered society. And I think in your introduction, you mentioned that in no small part, because of what we would regard as the very successes of the kind of dynamism of the increasingly globalized, the outsourcing of our industrial production in the name of sort of efficiency and lower prices, the, the kind of corresponding financialization of the American economy. And I think the measurable growth of a divide between the wealthy and the less well-off in part of the country where I live in the Midwest, of course, you know, sort of almost violently evident that this has proven to be of such enormously destabilizing consequence for our country and for our countrymen that, again, what you could say looks like, to use the terms of my book, what looks like a success actually is merely a kind of shroud on what is more than Let's talk about the new book, Regime Change, as I say, again, in which you make the case for what you argue liberalism has failed and what should replace it. And you locate this book and this argument very much in the kind of politics and what I found particularly fascinating about this in the politics of the day. And you very much associate yourself with the tensions between the few and the many, as you call them, you know, the elites, the people, the kind of populist political turbulence that we've seen in the last few years here in the United States in particular, but in most of Western Europe too, the Brexit vote, other places there. And you very much talk in terms of the historic tension between the few and the many. And so if you would talk a little bit about, again, what characterizes the current politics in America, particularly, we'll talk about America, with the capture, if you like, of these institutions by an elite and the leading institutions, as it were, so, so the most powerful institutions, the capture of those institutions by the elite and their relationship to the many, to the people. Explain how that's come about and how that reflects what's gone wrong with liberalism, if you like. So I'm a professor of political philosophy in the tradition of uh, thinkers like Leo Strauss and Eric Vogelin, great heroes of the conservative movement. I'm very much an admirer of those thinkers and others. And like those thinkers, I regularly teach and turn to the classical texts of our tradition, of the Western tradition, pass on the kind of teachings of those texts to my students. But I also read them with an eye to how are these books still speaking to us today? And in teaching these books regularly, encounter over and over again, especially in the kind of classical and medieval tradition is the repeated emphasis that every political order 
is more or less destined to a kind of internal destruction, a kind of self-destruction, because of this kind of ever-present and seemingly unavoidable division that exists between what Aristotle and others do and the few. The partisans of the people or the populace, of course, from which we get the word populism, whom he describes as typically, it's just simply built into the nature of reality, they tend to be poorer. They tend, you know, the more more people in any given society are going to have less money than a relatively few number of people who are going to have more money. And so that it just so happens that every society is driven by this seemingly unavoidable conflict between the many poor and the few wealthy. And so this isn't Karl Marx who first thought of these things. This is, you know, in ancient Greek philosophy. And Aristotle suggests that every society, therefore, is going to take generally one of two forms. It's either of the poor many who will run rampant over, at least for a while, over the few wealthy until they sort of completely deprive them of every possession they have. And you could say this is the, the sort of the definition of a kind of left populism or a kind of Marxism or oligarchies in which the wealthy few rule over poor many and kind of prevent them from ever having a bit more of the pie. And as I'm reading and teaching these texts in the last couple of years, given our contemporary American politics, I'm just thinking, man, this stuff is just like out of the headlines of the Wall Street Journal. or This describes to a T. And then you begin to read their prescriptions. And the prescriptions are ones that at least once were central in the conservative tradition. I'm speaking to you from Annapolis, Maryland, where I've been taking part in an ISI, Intercollegiate Studies Institute, honors program with about 30 or 40 undergraduate students. And the text occurs, The Roots of American Order. And all over this book, which was published in 1974, is exactly what I commend in my recent book, which is a revisiting and the effort to reinstitute the idea of the mixed constitution, a kind of blending of the features or qualities of democracy and oligarchy so that their qualities decline, and the kind of positive and virtuous sides of each of these two parties come to the fore. And so this is what Aristotle commends as probably the most plausible way to create a good regime, which is to take the two most common elements of any political order, the wealthy few and the men, poor or many, and to kind of blend their qualities. And he proposes what some of those look like. And my book is really just an effort to reimagine for contemporary times what that might look like and how we might pursue that. Just to go back on this sort of the people versus the elites, if you like, the many versus the few. Again, these are characteristic of, as you say, pretty well all organized societies throughout history. What's gone wrong here in the United States? I think most of us would agree, whatever our different perspectives on conservatism, that the United States today or Western civilization, if you can call it that, Western countries are dominated at the political, cultural, corporate level by a particular class. And again, you describe these people very well in the book. We're all very familiar with them, sort of highly educated, kind of highly segregated, enjoying luxury beliefs and virtue signaling and all the rest of it. But they do seem to have established a remarkable grip in a way in the last 30 years that has kind of turned around so many of the kind of traditional political structures that we used to think about. I mean, we used to think about the establishment being sort of somehow conservative or the big business was somehow conservative and favoured sort of generally like what we think of as conservative ideas, where now we seem to have this sort of woke corporations and we have a political establishment which is going in this direction. How does this relate to your argument about liberalism, that in particular that it was the structures of liberalism that enabled this extreme manifestation of this seizure of power, if you like, of the major institutions of power by these cultural political elites. This is actually where I begin the book, is to try to tell something of the story. And here again, I do lay some of the blame for our current political troubles, what I describe as the liberal left, as well as the liberal right, kind of classical liberals. And the essential of the basic argument is that one of the fundamental features of liberalism is that in the name of increasing and securing the greatest degree of individual liberty, the ability and capacity, almost the Justice Kennedy definition of liberty to define one's own existence, the sweet mystery of life passage in the Casey decision, that one of the results of that is the kind of, you could say, the, what we see, the evidence all around us, a decline of the kinds of institutions and the practices and even and the kind of cultural norms that I don't know how old you are, if you're some way, some, if we share cer certain generational similarities, the kind of world we grew up in, 
in which you had certain norms and certain expectations, but also the kinds of institutions that kind of populated the world that helped to institute or to perpetuate those norms. And the more one seeks to secure one's individual, the weaker and weaker those institutions are going to become the more they're going to decline because those are institutions that in many cases are going to limit my ability to divine who I am. And this is one of the main reasons I think we see the decline of, of course, religion, the decline of associations, and perhaps most alarmingly today, the decline of family, the kind of decimation of people marrying each other and the remarkable decline of people having children. And so in the name of this ongoing increase of liberty, we see a decline of what, you know, again, something like Russell Kirk would see and define as the essential need for order. It turns out that the condition liberation of the self and the corresponding decline of the social order benefits a particular class of people. And the particular class of people are people who thrive in conditions of the kind of unbounded world that we have created, the borderless world that's literally borderless in the geographic sense. But it's also borderless in the moral. You have to kind of make up your own morality as you go along without the institutions that kind of support that and make possible a kind of flourishing life for those who aren't, for whatever reason, it's in their build and their makeup to thrive in the conditions of an unbounded liberty. And I think this is the defining characteristic of what I think Aristotle would describe as our oligarch. The oligarchic class that does tend to control more of the resources in our society, which is neither necessarily left nor right. The wealthy few, I think, transcend parties in this sense. But one thing that's true is that the kind of the oligarchy today really does seek to defend this world. And the people who are really not benefiting from this world, I think, in measurable ways, it's the many poor, the many what we might think of as those who have tended to in a more populous direction. And one only needs to turn to the work of someone like Charles Murray and his book Coming Apart to see the really powerful and kind of irrefutable social evidence of this kind of growing divide, not just of our classes, but the way in which the classes are thriving and not thriving in these conditions of what I would describe as the sort of success of liberalism. I think this is the backdrop of where I see the rise of this particular class divide. Which leads to the paradox. To be fair, you address this paradox in the book, which is that some of these sort of social pathology, or if you, you know, you talk about the damage, if you like, that kind of conceptions of extreme liberalism have done and the kind of sexual more in terms of what sexual mores have done or, you know, economic liberalism has done. It is quite striking, isn't it? That Actually, according to all of the data we have, it's these elites who are kind of driving this sort of cultural revolution who actually more often tend to live lives that are what might be called sort of in a more kind of culturally traditional way. Rates of divorce are much lower among the highly educated than they are among the less well-educated and what we might call the working classes. Again, sort of the various kind of social pathologies that we're seeing, family breakdown and violence and all of those kind of things seem heavily to be concentrated among the many, if you like, among sort of the, you know, the working class, the masses. How do you explain that paradox? I think it's precisely a follows along the lines of what I just said, which is, as it turns out, certain kinds of benefits and advantages. And one thing we can say is that going to elite universities and getting a kind of elite education teaches you or certainly fortifies and amplifies the kinds of self-discipline one will need to have the the kind of forms of self-control, self-discipline, the old language would call it virtue, to know that one needs to behave and act in certain ways in order to lead a flourishing life. The people who are attending these institutions, the people who teach at these institutions, the kind of official sort of stance of these institutions, is all of the traditional norms, all of these the institutions that once were the embodiment and the kind of defenders of these norms, that these are all oppressive institutions. And these all need to be in some way, shape, or form either redefined or taken down. Seeing as a kind of privatization of virtue, almost a kind of class monopolization and formation in certain kinds of virtue in what used to be, I think, as I describe in the book, a kind of an ideal of formation in virtue as a kind of public utility. 
as something that we as a society are, you know, whether it's conscious or unconscious, we're devoted to sort of advancing. And this is something that at least I think the ruling class when I was growing up, this is not ancient history. This is only you know 50 years ago. I think the ruling class was pretty much on board with the idea that it was kind of the duty, the responsibility, a kind of noblesse oblige of the ruling class to see that they were the embodiment and a kind of duty to advance the ideals of stability and order and decency. And what we have seen is the kind of replacement of that ruling class with a completely different ethos. So I think you're absolutely right. And we can all see visibly that this ruling class is a particularly distinct and a particularly pernicious kind of ruling class that the kind of described as the elite, and that they are, in fact, kind of increasingly monopolizing the benefits that would accrue and be necessary for a more widespread sense of flourishing. And if I may, there's one other aspect of this that I emphasize in the book, and this is that the current ruling class, in fact, is engaged in issues, which is to claim that it is the greatest defender of egalitarianism, that it is the embodiment of an egalitarian ethos, so that they are actually not in any way, shape, or form the elite or the ruling class. They are defending the ideals of equality, of, of course, the language of equity, diversity, equity in college campuses and elsewhere, and that they are in many ways standing against what they say is the privilege of those who benefit the beneficiaries of historical injustices. And so that the working class, especially the white working class, becomes the embodiment of a kind of attribution of being privileged and the embodiment of a certain kind of unjust form of privilege. Those who are in these, especially the most elite institutions, crow about how egalitarian they are. So I think it comes close to being a kind of class self-deception that's intended to be a more widespread social deception about the very nature of the oligarchic order that's governing us today. We're going to take a quick break there, but when we come back, I'll have more with Patrick Deneen on why and how liberalism has failed, he argues, and what should be the ideal post-liberal future. Stay with us. You're listening to Free Expression with Jerry Baker. Don't forget, you can listen to the latest episode anytime on your smart speaker. Just say, play the Opinion Free Expression podcast. Now, back to Jerry Baker. I'm back with Professor Patrick Deneen of the University of Notre Dame, who's got a new book out called Regime Change Towards a Post-Liberal Future. Well, I want to get on to your prescriptions and some of the specific ones, but, but you make it the general prescription you have, if we can call it that, is for a kind of mixed constitution. Instead of the overthrow of the elites, it's kind of maybe the left would argue, and even maybe some on the populist right would argue, the overthrow of elites and the kind of rule by the masses and a pure populist rule. You talk about the need for the creation of a new elite, which is aligned with the values and interests of the people, of the masses. And you call this, I don't know if you're the progenitor of this term, but you call this aristopopulism, that sort of idea of a kind of, again, the creation of a new elite that is aligned with the masses. Explain what you mean by that. Then you can give us some of the examples of how this might be achieved and what it might represent. So one of the first main theses of this book is that it seems like the current political divide is driven by the both unrealistic and I think ultimately undesirable desire on the part of the partisans of each of these parties, of the many and the few, if this analysis is correct, the partisans of each of these parties, that the solution to our politics would be, in some sense, the elimination of the other side. And that what would allow for America to become America again, or America to become the best version of itself, populists were eliminated at some level or if the elites were eliminated. And so our politics today, if you listen to it, really seems to be driven by this idea that we just have to just crush and eliminate the other party and the kind of belief system of the other party. And then all will be well. And this seems to me to be fundamentally not only, again, an unrealistic ambition, but it's fundamentally wrong because if Aristotle and Polybius and Aquinas and many of them, our founding fathers are correct, you will never ever have a society in which you eliminate the members of these two parties. So the answer isn't the kind of rhetorical stance of our current politics, doesn't lie in what I think is the pang and the way in which we battle in the political field today. But the answer lies in a kind of redefinition and a re-understanding and reformulation of the elite to be much more aligned with the concerns and needs of the demos 
But at the same time, this isn't to say that the demos is the sort of the kind of embodiment of all virtues. I think Charles Murray data suggests the the demos today is, is fairly degraded. And I'm not blaming them for this condition, but the social economic conditions today have really degraded them to a state of a kind of absence of, of certain kinds of virtues. So I take it in some ways as a manifestation of a certain dynamic that gives me some hope which is a kind of pushback from the bottom against those over them, which I see as a kind of necessary beginning of moving our politics more in the direction of this ideal of the mixed constitution, of the mixing of the elements of the classes that can create a kind of balance. But this mixing can't just be overturning the elite or just saying the demos should rule, but should have, I would hope, a kind of beneficial effect in some senses, forcing either our current elites to change their ways or to be replaced, but in turn leading to the constitution of a new elite that will actually work on elevated economic and moral conditions of the many today, who I think are in just a very terrible way. You know, as Christopher Lash was able to argue, you know, 30 or 40 years ago, that demos is the sort of embodiment of all virtues. I just don't think one could make that argument today. So it's an effort to think again in these kind of Aristotelian terms for what would it take to begin to craft a kind of contemporary version of this ideal of a mixed constitution. You very much argue that there are reforms that can achieve this through the political process. Some things you talk about are things like political changes, like maybe, you know, so again, many things that people have talked about, but expanding the House of Representatives, improving the condition of worker representation on corporate boards and the sort of German model, breaking up big cities, maybe the reintroduction of national service, of conscription you talk about. So it's essentially realigning these elites, because elites, no elite ever just gives up power voluntarily. I think it in history, right. but what you want to achieve, which is realigning the elite or creating a new elite that is aligned with the people, you do that through the political process, through the electoral process, and you make these changes in, you know, you, these are essentially kind of political and economic reforms that you're proposing. Yeah, you mentioned the chapter in which I propose some of the more polar policy or electoral kinds of aims or objects or policies. And the chapter is called Aristopopulism. And I don't know if I'm the creator of that term. It may have existed before. I know the word aristo-democracy. I found a book of that title. But the basic idea is that these two phenomena as, as opposites to begin to say that there's a way in which you could have an aristocracy. And this, of course, in Aristotle's terms, the opposite of an oligarchy is an aristocracy. So that, that for Aristotle, it has positive connotations. It means rule by the excellent, rule by fine people, rule by the good people. And so to have an elite, which you're always going to, who's much more closely aligned with the kind of needs and interests and the conditions that allow for the flourishing of our fellow countrymen, regardless of their kind of socioeconomic status. And by flourishing, I mean not only economic flourishing, I think that's the way in which the left would more or less think about these terms, but also bound up with that, their moral flourish, to have the conditions that allow them to have thriving families, to have marriages that last, to have deep and enduring relationships with people in their communities that become sustaining. And I think part of this too, I hope, would be a a revival and a deepening of our ability to be a, a society that worships and has a kind of deep sense of reverence toward creation. And um, I describe in this chapter, I say what's needed is Machiavellian means to Aristotelian ends. And that some of my readers have assumed I mean by this, you know, do anything to achieve the ends that you want. And that's not to read me, (laughs) that's to impute to me certain views. What I really mean by that is that Machiavelli also has an idea institution, but his idea was that you would have this kind of constant clash and this constant, almost semi-violent opposition and conflict between the many and the few. And from this kind of constant conflict, a kind of political... I'm not going to call it harmony, but a kind of standoff would arise. And it actually ended up informing some of the ideas of our founding fathers when they thought about the idea of checks and balances, that the kind of interests would end up sort of checking each other and preventing them from dominating the other one. But when I say Machiavelli means to Aristotelian ends, I mean using the contemporary conflict of our politics, driven especially by populist discontents against the contemporary oligarchy, as a means that I would like to see of a much more Aristotelian form of mixed constitution. In Aristotle's view, the good policy is not the result of a kind of ongoing and unending conflict that becomes stalemate between the classes, 
but a kind of harmony and even French classes, a kind of blending to the point where the almost those two classes, they don't cease to exist. The differences between them become much more modest and minor, much less a source of resentment or a sense of domination or superiority. So Machiavellian means is really to say that for maybe a period of time, we're going to need this energy to chasten, perhaps to change, perhaps to drive out the current elites, but with the purpose not of merely dominating them, but of fostering a new kind of politics, including a new kind of elite, that become much more, in that Aristotelian understanding, much more a source of harmony and civic friendship. I want to take us from the from Aristotle and Machiavelli into the current millennium and say, I know you're not a political pundit. I'm not asking you to handicap the uh, Republican primary race. You know, there are many references you have to Donald Trump in your book and the state of the Republican Party today. Do you generally think the domination as we seem to have right now, frankly, of the Republican Party and indeed perhaps, you know, the right side of American politics by Donald Trump, irrespective of what you think of the man himself, do you think that actually is moving the country in the direction that you've outlined in this book and that you argue that we need to go, that actually in broad terms, the kind of Trumpian populism that we're seeing is, is broadly where we should be going? Well, I think one thing it's that the appearance and partial success of Donald Trump has done is absolutely energized to the point of red hot fury, energized the liberal oligarchy, <laughs> liberal oligarchy of both the right and the left. I think, you know, the fact that you have a kind of interesting and increasingly wedding or a kind of marriage between the kind of never Trump old Republicans, people who still are considered conservatives on the pages of the New York Times and the Washington Post, that these people who are called uh, so despise, of course, they despise Trump. But at a deeper level, I think they despise the threat that Trump and the Trump supporters pose to their commitment to a right liberal order or a classical liberal order. And of course, we see on the left just absolutely almost deranged madness when it comes to anything Trump. You know, we used to respond to someone like George Bush or George H.W. Bush was unhinged. But the response to Trump has really become just an absolute mental breakdown of our nation. Is that because of the character of the man, though, or is that because of what he represents to a lot of people? He represents this challenge to the established elites, or is it actually, I mean, to be fair to some of those established elites, more to do with what they see as poor character on his part? You know, you would love a world, you would love, love an experiment in which we could say we could have a kind of very measured and version of a Donald Trump and see what the reaction would be. But I actually suspect the reaction might not be all that different. You know, I think if someone like J.D. Vance were running for president, which I personally hope will happen at some point, maybe some people think he's just mad and insane. But I think you would see like approximating the same kind of fear over someone who posed a threat to the deepest commitments and even almost religious commitments on the part of the progressive left, as well as the kind of classical liberal right, that either on the economics front or on the kind of social issues that someone like that would provoke, or maybe not the same, I think, across the board agreement and and sense that this man is just completely unfit for office, with which I don't necessarily disagree. But I think that at a deeper level, the fury over the character of the man acts as a kind of mass. Um, the deeper source of the fury, which is a defense of the current regime. It's defense of the current political order to which large numbers of people who have come of age committed to this particular alignment of liberalism that is recognizable only if you have a left and a right liberalism opposing one another, and truth had nailed potentially to the death not to allow a kind of alternative to either right or left liberalism to come into being. I guess an objection that some people have raised to your arguments, and it certainly occurs to me as I read both these books, is that in the end what you're arguing for is essentially the kind of the substitution of, of the sort of values and ideas of the current ruling classes, the current establishment. You don't like that, and I don't like that, by the way. I'm completely with you on this. The kind of replacement with the prevailing orthodoxy that you and I might like, and that we think that should be the precepts and the principles by which the country should be run. And the beauty of liberalism, if you like, this country has lost, I think, a lot of the idea of the principle of pluralism. You know, people are allowed to hold different views about the way society should be run without one kind of view absolutely sort of extirpating uh, all alternatives and the other, and these ideas can kind of coexist. And again, that is what liberalism allows, isn't it? And it allows for 
the ebb and flow of political fortunes and, you know, the swing of the pendulum politically. Whereas, again, you seem to just want to sort of assert a set of political values that you and I may hold, but which perhaps half the country doesn't hold, and put that in charge rather than the existing framework. And surely, again, as I say, that the value of liberalism is that it enables liberty, it enables people to be able to choose their own path rather than have one prevailing ideology. Yeah, this is a common and a powerful objective. And I answer this in the same way that people usually describe efforts to constitute some alt form by ideals of natural law and ideals of sort of classical political theory, which is the following accusation about liberalism in this case, which is that it all sounds good in theory, but it doesn't work in practice. It seems to me that defining a liberal order, and A's order is liberal, at some level it is an order that has arisen out of the liberal tradition. You may think, and others think it's a kind of departure from it, but I actually think it's the realization of certain tendencies and trajectories within the liberal order. And it seems to me that this is an order that is not an order that is pluralistic, certainly not tolerant. It is an order that is becoming more and more tyrannical, more and more authoritarian, and it's doing so, ironically enough, in the name of liberty. People who now are being subject to these authoritarian and even tyrannical and dictatorial efforts on the part of government or on the part of the institutions of our society, the people who are being subjected to this are the people who are making arguments on behalf especially of order, on behalf of a society that has to be ordered in certain ways, whether it's defending what's called traditional marriage or the difference between a man and a woman or certain kinds of religious beliefs. These are the people who are now being increasingly sort of either or even actually suppressed by the order of liberalism. And it makes sense, given what I began by saying, which is that any belief system that becomes an obstacle to the full, complete, thoroughgoing, unobstructed condition of individual liberty and individual self-definition must become subject to the logic of the superior claims, the, the, those claims that will trump anything else, and those claims are that of individual liberty. So there's a kind of ironically built into the very nature of liberalism is that it will become authoritative. It will become even to the point of becoming tyrannical. And the thing that is the kind of paragon of pluralism and openness, to use the word of your the name of your podcast, it will be the antithesis of a kind of free speech. And, and this is where I think the critiques of myself and a number of people who share my view have really gained traction, especially I think with younger people who've grown up in this world, which is their belief that any society, and I don't believe that any society can be kind of neutral and ultimately can't be neutral on questions about what it is we value as a kind of social, as a kind of society. If we're going to be a society in any sense, if we're going to be a kind of order in any sense, there are always going to be fundamental beliefs and fundamental commitments that are going to be predominant. Of course, that some people may not like those, but that's just the truth of the matter, that every political social order is going to have a predominant set of commitments and beliefs, and those will be expressed in and throughout that order. And it just so happens that the one that we have come to see become predominant today is that of liberalism. So I think rather than suggesting that this condition of authority and authoritative values of individual liberty and self-making can be that the alternative is a kind of neutrality or a kind of, as, as you put it, a kind of pluralism. I think that a growing number of younger conservatives, and I think you know myself certainly, believe that rather conservatives today should be asserting a robust understand we value and not shy away from either articulating those or even saying that you need the authoritative use of political authority and power to advance those. And if it means that we will prefer in our public policy the formation of family, protection of religion, and so forth, that so be it. That given a choice between this order that we live in and an order we care about are prioritized, I know where I stand. Patrick Deneen, Professor of Political Science at the University of Notre Dame and author of Regime Change Toward a Post-Liberal Future. Thanks very much indeed for joining Free Expression. Thanks so much, Jerry, for having me. Well, that's it for this week's episode of Free Expression. Please join us again next week when we'll be taking a look at another topic of importance to politics, economics, culture, the world. Look forward to speaking to you again next week. Please join us then. Bye-bye.